All right, Academy, welcome back to our next session, which is a fireside chat. And I have to admit publicly here, I'm very excited about the next session. And I'm excited for two reasons, and those two reasons are the two speakers of Fireside Chat. So they will talk about how to build, grow, and scale your product. And the first speaker is no unknown to the Academy. Um, his name is Jonathan Tio. You might know him under Jonathan Team Merka Tio because he was yesterday one of the participants at the Investors Feud. So for those of you who haven't seen the Investors Feud, which was great, and you haven't seen John T. Merck in action, he's a co-founder and managing partner of Binary Capital, which is an early stage technology focused investment firm in Silicon Valley. Just to give you a few selected startups they invested in. They were early investors in tech companies like Snapchat, Instagram, Twitter, he was actually an early advisor to Tinder. And what we learned yesterday in the investors' field, he did not invest into Dropbox, even though he had the chance to. So himself, by the way, he has a tech background. He is a graduate from Stanford. He was an early engineering executive at Google. He, he was leading the international R&D there. And he himself published works and patents in the fields of wireless security. So I would like to ask you to welcome on stage the really big applause John T. Merka, Teo! So are you, are you ready? Yeah. All right, great. Um, I would like to introduce our second speaker. Now for it, I would need slides, please. My slides. Um, so our next speaker is like Andreas Klinger. Who is the CTO of Product Hunt? Like, who knows Product Hunt? 70%, 80% of the audience. Um, so this is a very, very special moment for me personally. You know, because Andreas and me, we go way back. Um, just a second. Holy shit. Yeah. Uh, and um, like, he was one of the first people I met in the startup community in Austria. Actually, he's doing startups since 2008, a time where not many people were doing startups in Austria. He was part of the first events that Pioneers did, which were like startup weekend-like style events, even those back in the days in Kosovo and other regions. Um, he is one of the co-founders of Garms, which pivoted into Look, which was a fashion tech startup. He was a mentor at, at Seedcamp. He is and was a lean camp evangelist, and now is the CTO of Product Hunt. But what he is, and that's so important, I want to share this with you, he is for us someone very important in the local ecosystem. And um, to demonstrate how the importance of him, you know, like I, I want to share like a little story and uh, do a little t thing with you. So Andy was one of the first people who was there for everyone doing mentoring for free, helping around everyone there in the scene where the scene was very small and growing. So in this crucial stage where there was like so fr fragile the startup scene, he was there helping anyone, connecting people. And then the problem with him is he was always gone, right? He was like suddenly in London, gone, in Berlin, gone, coming back, now he's in the valley. So the problem with Andy is we love him here. He did a lot, but he's always away. So it kind of with Andy, it is like, you know, the hunt for Andreas sometimes. <laughs> it's difficult to find him. And you know, that's, that's not only something that's only stories, but also in pictures. Let's do a test with you, see if you can find Andreas around. So, where's Andreas? Yes, that's him. It was hiding. Okay, that was a difficult one. But our life always was hunting Andreas. That's a more easy one. There he is. That was in Sofia 2012, first time we went, we met. But you know, the, the life of Andreas, always trying to find him. You know, see, do you see me in the picture? That was in Budapest, the seed camp event. Do you see him? No, right? He's hidden. He's always hiding. We always have to hunt him because great. Do you see him here? It was an event from Austrian startups. What? Yeah, exactly. Someone has very good eyes. So Andreas, you know, always hiding. It was difficult. But then there was a game changer. Suddenly, he wasn't hidden anymore. And suddenly, he wasn't only the local hero we had in the ecosystem. But suddenly, whole Austria got to know him because this happened. <laughs> it actually means king of the geeks. So we were so proud in our community to have finally one of our local heroes being on the cover of Forbes magazine that the whole Austria knew about it. That's him, by the way. And this is what the reaction was. This is the selection of dozens, if not hundreds of pictures people posted from the community showing off and being proud of Andreas. 
or like this in different areas with different faces. It actually went even to the me news media where they talked about it. And this is a picture from ten Tanzania. So it went once around the world. So what I want to say is this. Since the whole thing happened with Forbes, I think the rest of Austria knows what we already own in the community. The Dundee is an amazing guy who did a lot for the community. So that's why very special, very, very big, very, very warm applause for Andreas. <laughs>
Uh, I have to give you a real example and, and, and the ephemerality of it, the user brand really was you got to get on it because otherwise you can't see the photos that um, can, can post it last night. Yep. You know, so it's creating this vernacular that happens only when you're on the product. If you can really define a use case that uh, people within the product uh, talk about that you, you, you have to be part of, otherwise you can't participate in that conversation, you have uh, one of the ingredients for, for eventual growth. So when you say brand ambassadors, you essentially mean highly activated users, like people who are using the product every day? Um, it, it depends. They, they sometimes use it every day. Uh, so in, in Snapchat's case, yes. Um, what, what we looked at was the users that, because if you go, just to take a step back, you know, Snapchat started to grow in the earlier stages in the end of 2011, early 2012. And um, this was past the stage where, or past the era where you looked at cohort analysis. You know, cohort analysis, you really cared about that in, oh, I don't know, from 04 to somewhere around 09. And uh, after that, because mobile ubiquity was starting to really take shape, um, cohorts were not as interesting to an analyze anymore. Um, what, what we looked at was, given an active user on a single day, let's say today is Wednesday, uh, given an active user on Wednesday across all your cohorts, how are they active on the platform on every consecutive day following? So if you're active today on Wednesday, what percentage of those active users are coming back on Thursday, Friday, Saturday? And with Snapchat, you know, across, across three days of active consecutive users, we had, they had about, I think it was about 96% repeat rate. Um, give you an example, SMS is close to 98%. Uh, a broadcast platform like Instagram would be much lower because you know, that's more of a, back then it was more of a weekly uh, usage case. So it was more, more around 20, I think it was about 20, 21%. So is it a package in something that people can like reuse? So what you did is you looked at like who were the most active users and you tried to find like patterns in like who are they? Maybe it's like there are other people like them. And also you like, you defined like highly active in the case of Snapchat, like actually every day, sequentially every day. Yes. And this was like the definition of active user. Because highly pro active user. products, exactly right. The products are different. Snapchat started out more as a communication product, whereas Instagram was always a broadcast product. So a communication product, you want to see um, a, a very strong pull mechanism. So you come back every day, every time you send a message out. You, you've heard of Snapchat streaks, right? It's, it's that core. Uh, have, you, have you guys heard of Snapchat streaks? <laughs> All right. it's a who, who, who here knows Snapchat? <laughs> anyway, okay. it's going to be big. Leave, leave your hands up, please. <laughs> who here knows Snapchat? Leave the hands up, please. Okay, who here gets Snapchat? <laughs> yeah, this, <laughs> this is what I was assuming. You know, the funny story is back, back when I first learned about it, what, what got me excited about Snapchat was I, I read this tweet from, I think it was a 13 or 14-year-old girl. And um, uh, the tweet wrote, Finally, it's okay to take an ugly photo of myself. And I was like, yeah, yeah. that's, that's like, right. <laughs> the, the weird thing about this is that I always assume that they have just like fancy looking, but actually horrible UX. So it's like, oh, I, like come on, I studied. Like I went to university, I have no idea how to use this thing. You know? Yeah, uh, but, but that, that's actually a very good point. At the early stage of product development or, 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 or um, product growth, um, you know, you might get advice, and I, I, don't, I don't actually think I should be sharing any advice because every product is different, but I can share at least some of my experiences. Uh, my experience is that a lot of people advise you to create as little friction to adoption as possible. I actually have seen that the products that work best in the early stages create a lot of friction for adoption. And the reason they do that, or some chance upon it, uh, and that's why you have sometimes very terrible UXs in the early stages. Uh, it's because it creates a very emotional experience that a user has with a product, and that really helps in the word of mouth. For, for instance, um, you know, Snapchat, to use that example, uh, in the early days, you couldn't log in uh, via OAuth, you couldn't log in via Facebook Connect. You actually had to go to your friend, say, hey, download it, you can't even search for me using your phone book. I have to actually get your username and key it in for you. It made the relationship with every person you onboarded a very personal uh, and, and, and uh, an involved one. And so that started to build that word of mouth. Um, 
I love to talk a little bit about you know what you guys see at Product Hunt, but just to cap off that thought around um, figuring out where your core cohorts are. You know, Snapchat actually developed um, initially in Scandinavia, so right here in Europe. Uh, the, really? The, yeah, the, the the fastest growing demographic, and actually about. I may be getting these numbers wrong, but about 60, 65 percent of the, the the user base was up in uh, Denmark in Copenhagen, and so we actually who analyzed. Who were those people? That. Who were those people? What did they do? They were mostly college kids, and um, one of the interesting things that uh, you know was dived into with the college kids was that you you, you were trying to figure out why these ambassadors uh, were ambassadors and why it was growing so virally there, and what we found was that. And you guys might know better than I do, but, but what we found or learned was that college kids in Copenhagen tend to hang out a lot just sitting on benches and cafes after school, not doing much schoolwork, and uh, they would talk, talk about products. And it's very different than the college demographic in the U.S. where they actually get engaged in a lot of other activities, uh, but it was very similar to the high school demographic in the U.S. And so, so they, yeah. it basically had the same use case, right? Very similar. So, yeah. like, one of the most fascinating things is that when people speak about product, they usually speak about like demographics and this kind of stuff. But very often, people with completely back different background, age, jobs, actually have similar use cases. And it's like one of the most interesting things is usually not, like to step away from demographics and just like like what are they actually trying to accomplish? And there's like the framework by Clay Christians, as you know, like jobs to be done, where you basically think about like what are they actually trying to accomplish, mm -hmm. and are we doing a good job? in like fulfilling that. Like yes. are we as a product, like let's assume that we as a product are succeeding if we make happen what our users want to, make, like, want to do. And if we do this, we can measure this and we can actually see if we are like for each of these different use cases are fulfilling a good use case. Mm -hmm. And from my point of view, this is like the most natural um, like approach to metrics, like to product metrics. Uh, because like, what a lot of people do is like they, they focus on like optimization Right. Especially early stage. Right. So you, you, you take all the learnings you have from online marketing, so like funnel optimization, land, landing page optimizations, all this kind of stuff, yep. and you try to apply it for your product, but it barely makes sense. And you have like very little numbers. What kind of works, at least in my experience, and this is what we also did product hunt, for example, is you try to figure out what is the, we call it the job, like what is the use case a user actually tries to do, and you group the users based on these different use cases. And for example, those who don't know Product Hunt, it's like a website where you can discover new products. And if you build anything... Everybody should be on Product Hunt, by the way, because I think that's a very important point. Yeah. Um, the, the fact that Product Hunt, you know, Andreas in particular, gets to see all sorts of different products at the very early stages and gets to track them through their success, you build a lot of pattern recognition around the kinds of conversations that happen around these products early on. This is, for example, like actually one of the jobs we have. Like we believe that there are the people who build and they want to launch, and that's great. And they want to have success, find investors and journalists, and they do this very often for our side. But there's also like a lot of people who like have a product background, for example, or like a VC background, and they either want to stay up to date with the market or they want to stay up to date with product trends. And so we actually group them as like, for example, I want to stay up to date, and this is like something where I use it daily. Mm -hmm. And there are some who just are afraid to miss out. And those won't use it daily. Those won't, they will use it maybe like once a week whenever a competitor pops up. You know? right. But in that moment, you don't really want to miss a competitor popping up or in your case, like a potential next investment popping up. And these are very distinct, like not very distinct, but like these are distinct groups where you can measure if you actually build a good product for them. And when you do like these different groups and you define like what is quantified yeah. or like if you can quantify it, or what is the goal they try to achieve, you try to quantify it and usually what it comes down to is that you have one of those use cases or like many come down to like one core API, uh, sorry, KPI. Yep. And so for example, in, in Product Hunt, it's product discoveries, which means either you see it on Product Hunt or you see it because of Product Hunt, because you click through Product Hunt. Yeah. Um, at Instagram, like what did you use at core KPI at Instagram? Well, so that's, that's interesting, you know, the, the, and, and we had this conversation about um, what, what, what metrics an investor looks for and what metrics you should look at when <laughs> you're actually in the ops mode. Um, they are very different because some, some of the metrics that you look at when you're at scale uh, usually are focused on business model because you want to end up starting to monetize, you need to push on those metrics. But at the early stages, what you should look at from an ops perspective, from the core KPIs are not necessarily those. It's what we call uh, intermediary metrics. So metrics that actually drive the core value, or, or give you insight into the core value of what the product is. 
Uh, Instagram's case, yes, they were growing very fast, even in the early stages. I mean, um, you know, they, they had pivoted from this company called uh, Bourbon, a product called Bourbon. And uh, I, I, I know it was uh, a friend of mine, Steve Jang, that spoke to Systrem, and he said, oh, you should look at what Hipstamatic is doing with the filters, and that's why they introduced filters. And after that, it started to grow. Um, what was most interesting about a broadcast platform back then was figuring out what is the proportion of content that gets created that ends up being published or federated outside the platform. So if you remember in the early days of Instagram, those photos would get pushed out to Facebook, to Twitter. And so so like to, to, to paraphrase this, like your first core KPI was actually just getting people to post, and when this started to work, the core KPI was actually getting people to post and share, yeah. federate into other networks, yes. because this is your gro core growth mechanic. Yes, and, and one of the important things that we talk about a lot is uh, creation of branded content. Uh, you have, you know, we, we like investing in what we call conversation changes, companies that change the vernacular completely. And that's why to, to, to some of the stuff we were talking about earlier, um, conversation changing is not an iterative process. You know, a, a good product that can become an ecosystem is very different from a good product. And um, if you are creating a good product that can become an ecosystem, you do need to fundamentally change how people either think about the way they can interact with others, uh, change the way they can express themselves, uh, change the way they can interact with the world around them or transact in products and when services. When you say like interacting with the world, like uh, one thing that's kind of famous is like owning trigger moments, especially for commu consumer apps. So like owning what moment? A trigger moment. Trigger moment. So you're, yes. like, you're like in a very special situation, and you're like, that's beautiful. That's going on Instagram. You know, like I'm an right. artist. I I need to do that. Uh, that's so funny. That's that's going on Snapchat. You know, I'm I'm a genius. I have to instantly tweet this what I just said. You know. And these are like trigger moments. Yes, uh, that's, that's, uh, that's a very, very important point. We, we call it external triggers. Good products tend to have an external trigger, and your brand is so ubiquitous with that external trigger that, for instance, uh, every time I see a beautiful sunset or I see a beautiful location like this, I think Instagram. Every time I see something somewhat trivial but fun and, 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 and casual that I want to share with my friends, I should think Snapchat. Um, and so, so building, building a, a good product at an early stage is about really building the, um, what, what, what we call branded content. How do you identify a piece of content with a specific use case? And if you think about the early days of Instagram, every time, even if you didn't see it on Instagram, every time you saw a two by two photo with uh, a filter on it, you knew it was Instagram. Every time you saw a vertical photo that was a little bit blurry and a gray bar of text, you knew it from Snapchat. And, and that's what builds that word of mouth, because that branded content becomes a well-understood uh, meme that, that, that traverses different networks. And it's especially true for consumer apps. Partic uh, and sorry, I, I only do consumer apps these days. <laughs> um, one thing you said before which resonated with me was like um, how by the way, guys, we do like another one and a half minutes, and then we have like three minutes left, and we would like to do Q&A around like growth metrics. Like, if you have questions, be ready, OK? Um, so one thing you said before, which resonated to me, is like having a different point of view when you're like an investor, especially an investor who hasn't invested yet, or if you like press, or if you're actually in the product. Yeah. So and like one of the things like I love to do is building uh, charts for, uh, for example, for press, or like getting numbers for the press because there's no like there's like if you love bullshitting and let's be honest everybody here does otherwise we would have picked a different job um, if you love that doing like big numbers like yeah. the the amount of likes you had on your platform you know that's like a huge number you know the amount of like I have um, on Instagram, I have no idea, like the amount of photos, whatever. Like these are usually like big numbers, especially when you pick like an interaction where like several people can interact. And the press likes those big numbers. It's, it's amazing. It's but also great to like speak with investors. If they're a little bit more experienced, they want like a little bit more drill down metric. For product team, this is barely like this is completely use useless from my point of view. So I usually have this tendency to, when I think of product metrics, I like I have this philosophy like. The, dash the, the dashboard you look at and on a like, say weekly base mm -hmm. where you actually track your progress should either hurt you, like you look at the numbers and you're like, that's really embarrassing, I don't want to show anybody, or you should change what you're actually working on. Because maybe you don't pick like the one thing that's actually the biggest problem right now in your company. And one of the things is like that, that, that it's always fascinating to me is like dashboards in general. So, so that you kind of have like these dashboards that you use on a monthly base, on a weekly base maybe, mm -hmm. where you track stuff that's true 
even if you change the whole features, every page, if you change everything. Mm -hmm. And it would still be true because it still reflects the core use cases people want to do, like the core jobs. And your core KPI most likely won't change because your core API is linked to what your product should be doing. Because if it's not doing that, you pivot it. You know? And then there are these like, explorations where you like, pick like, a report because you want to like, figure something out very quickly. Or you like, focus on yes. a drill down thing because right now you need to improve the funnel of whatever or like, the conversion of whatever. And these tend to be mixed up very often. So what I, what I notice a lot when I speak with startups is this almost like data fatigue. Like you have all the data in the world, and you have almost no information to act on. Absolutely. You know? uh, yesterday, my friend Joe, Joe Lonsdale gave a, a talk. He does a lot more smart enterprise investing. And uh, what I really liked about one of his charts was uh, he talked about man and machine coming together. And I think it's very, very important to at least cover the topic that um, data is very, very important. That's no doubt about it. But your, your personal conviction as a founder around what your product represents and why you want it to uh, speak to users in a certain way is also really important. And you need to use the data to be able to back up some of your intuition. Um, you know, on, a, on a very subjective basis, defining what is actually going to make your product grow is as important as actually monitoring whether it's growing. So to give you an example with Tinder, when I, when I started working with the guys, they had about 5,000 users on the platform. They had about 60 to 80 downloads a day. Um, you know, eventually, they scaled it up to about 21 million users, uh, say maybe about uh, 80,000 downloads a day. I can't remember exactly. Um, but one of the core things that we were thinking about was, OK, shoot, we have a dating app in a very noisy environment. Dating is a very noisy space. How do you become differentiated from a Badoo or a OkCupid or a, you know, Match.com uh, or even Facebook? And, and the core insight that the guys had was quality, quality of the content on the platform. And so using the data, we really tried to understand, OK, where were the users that, like I say, were most uh, interested in spreading the word? But adding to that a very manual process, we literally had, they literally had two guys that would look at every single profile created um, in every new ge geography that it was launching in, and you would flag the content or the people whose profiles look really good. So if you remember, if you, you, you sign up for Tinder early on and you open it up, there was always beautiful people. And that was important because it created this ability for, uh, for the platform to be able to say, this is a high quality network. Don't feel bad about affiliating with it. We are not, and no offense to. Yeah. The, you know, and the, the second thing they actually did is like the people who matched with you are the first people you saw. So when you like open it, it's like, beautiful, swipe, match. And that's like, I will use this tomorrow. <laughs> yeah. You know, yeah. that, 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 I'm on a roll. Yeah, you know? uh, they did a very good job closing the Let's loops. do like two questions because we are like running out, like we are out of time. Let's right. do two questions. Uh, I hope you have questions around data or metrics or growth. Uh, do you want to pick the questions? Uh, how does this work? All right, uh, so I go up, I go up. We need this guy, we need this guy. Oh, yeah, okay. Hi. So I go up and people can ask questions by using slider, which they did and upload questions. So we can only take a few because we're already late. Quickly, if possible, please, the answer is. So what do you think about the app gaming market, especially quiz apps? Uh, I actually do like quiz apps. I think more around the polling side is interesting, but no one's yet really figured out a new way, as far as I'm concerned, to really engage users in an aspirational manner. Let's do the, t the tools. Um, Which like analytics tool do we use at Snapchat? So in the very, very early days, they used Flurry. Yeah. And it was not ideal, but it provided as much insight as we needed at the time. But of course, they started very, very quickly to build up their own internal data team. What I, what I notice very often is that a lot of startups obsess with the actual tooling behind uh, uh, metrics. In my personal experience, if you have yeah. like data in your database because you use a framework like Rails or whatever, and you have interconnection of the models of like what people actually act on, you have the most valuable data already in your system usually, unless it's a completely visitor, no interaction website. And what my ex personal experience is, you create very simple tables and dashboards around those, which are actually reflecting your core assumptions of the product, like the right. core KPIs. Right. Those don't change anyway, so you can like, create a report. In the beginning, you do it with like, spreadsheet, Excel, whatever. You create a report, at some point in the back end. You leave it there. You run it once every hour, once every day, doesn't matter. And you use whatever tools you have at hand for like, all the exploration, like Google Analytics, Mixpanel, you name it, doesn't matter. You use those for like, figuring out and like, putting ideas together and like, reality checks, essentially. Yeah, absolutely right. Um, all right, so can I? Can, did, you, did the Instagram snap the question? 
Uh, we haven't covered most of them, but... Uh, th th because it I says widely successful apps, but not solving big problems. What's going on? I, I completely yeah. disagree It's his with fault, that. by I the mean, way. He's investing in those. Just well, saying. <laughs> well, I mean, there's, there's a shift, right? So, so I think, I think um, you know, consumer behavior shifts as the tools that, uh, that are available uh, to them change. And uh, a lot of my interest right now, uh, and I hope a lot of other investors' interest right now, is, you know, my, my, my vision, obviously, is a world with equal access for all. And it's about breaking down the constraints to communicating, expressing, um, interacting or trading services uh, in an authentic way. And you know, I think what really spoke to me about Snapchat early on was Evan, Evan grew up in an age of, of very high social cost of uh, content creation. And, and his view was, I want to make it fun to talk to your friends again. And I think if you provide a new tool, it's like language. You know, it, it, the more words you add to your vernacular, the more able you are to express yourself. And that's what these companies are doing. They're providing people to become more human in a digital realm. Now, some of them use very, very, you know, some, some might argue not so responsible social mechanics and addiction mechanics to get people engaged, but you know, some, some others are actually trying the best they can to allow people a new avenue for expression. So I, I actually don't think it's, uh, it's solving the most important uh, problem of all, which is human-to-human -human communication. Okay, can, we have to come to an answer slowly, but I would like to ask this question, especially because yes or no answer. Do you like the business model canvas? <laughs> I, I, I don't know what that is. The okay, business model canvas? Right. So this is what they teach startups to learn becoming a startup, ah. in Europe especially. Um, I thought it was the company canvas. It's Yesterday I heard about it, I thought it was, why, why do people hate on the company canvas so much? <laughs> <laughs> so the, the core idea is like you have like your, your big idea and you split it down into like all the different aspects of it, like starting off like consumer facing partners, revenue costs and all these kind of things. Like my personal point of view, it's a very good tool for creating a fragment you can actually discuss. Because usually when you have like three founders at the table, everybody kind of understands something different. And when you're forced to like split it and like actually create fragments that are isolated, you know, and like would this stand by itself? Like what you just mentioned, no, it doesn't. Would this stand by itself? Ah, okay. And then you kind of have fragments where you can actually, are we speaking about this or this right now? And otherwise, if you don't, you end up in these discussions where everybody hears what they want to hear. For this kind of exploration, it's awesome for Later stage, it's, uh, you usually f are so focused on like, data and like, product that it's getting a little bit lost. I, I, I just one comment that I don't know much about the business model canvas, but what it sounds like to me is it, it does apply post a certain stage of the company. My view is ambition grows. If you start with building a very core utility that solves a need that hasn't been solved before, usually a personal problem, uh, your ambition grows over time. You start to see where that can be applied in new areas. You start to see new content types that you can bring in. You start to see new interaction models that you can bring in. So don't try to you know, have a view of the world that you want to bring in and, and, and what you can start to get, you know, just that first step yeah. and then take the second step. That's, that's, by the way, one of the things I learned in San Francisco the most, to focus on momentum. Yeah. Like, not so much like the actual speed you have, not so much like how big can it be because everybody can have a big vision, that's easy. It's more about this continuous momentum and maybe even like architect like storytelling around and like be sure that you have like this continuous momentum and get faster every step you take. I agree with that. Yeah. Gentlemen, cool. I love the momentum you built up here with the audience, but unfortunately we have to come to an end. We're over sure. time. I think it was a great session. I would ask all of you if you agree. Make some noise for John Andreas. Thank you very much. <laughs>